the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab episode 677 for Monday, October 2nd, 2017. Ah! Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in your questions, tips, nay, your quips. And cool stuff found. We'll make that efficient. Questions and tips become quips. And cool stuff found. We answer your questions. We share your tips. The goal is for each and every one of us, us included, to learn at least four new things each and every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Plex, a new sponsor at Plex.tv, where you can get a free Media server, media manager, and with coupon code MGG, a free month of their enhanced Plex, pa Plex Pass service. We'll talk more about that shortly here. And PDF Pen and all of the apps in the PDF Pen family from Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. We will talk more about that in a moment here, too, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut. John F. Ron. John F. Ron, the man who came up with the concept of the quip. How you doing today, John? Good. Hanging. That's good. That's good. You are uh, you are heading to see uh, a Synology event in New York this week. Is that right? Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, in Manhattan all the time now. Uh, I same live there. Yeah, I know. We were there last week. I'm going to be there Wednesday for the big Sonos announcement. And then you're going to be there Thursday for Synology. So it is, it is a crazy thing. And, and uh, the thing you're going to, what's that Thursday afternoon, the, the second, third, fourth, fifth uh, is open to the public too, right? As far as I can tell, as long as you signed up early enough and got a spot and confirm your spot. Are there, are there not still spots open? Uh Hard to say. All I know is that I, <laughs> there looks to be limited seating. So I'm not sure if you can uh, necessarily show up. At the okay. Last minute. Well, but we'll put, a link. We'll put a link in the show notes. It looked like, it looked like people could still sign up. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we have some business to get to. We have some follow-up and tips from the last episode, which I think will just sort of float us into cool stuff found. And, uh, and so we will start with our good friend Todd, who says in episode 676 regarding getting text written on the Mac moved over to iOS. You mentioned using the synced iCloud key clipboard, which, of course, works. Another method is to paste the text into Apple's notes app. If it's synced via iCloud, then you can find that note on the iPhone and copy paste from there. That's actually a handy, handy way to do things. It's how I used to do things before the uh before the whole iCloud clipboard came together. But if you've got multiple things that you need to sort of, you know, beam over there, that's not a bad way to do it. Maybe even just having sort of a scratch note in your, in your notebook that you, uh, that you use. Right. And I had just done that today because I had an app and it had a long piece of numeric data that I didn't want to type in by hand and I highlighted it. And then, you know, I held down and one of the options was share. Huh. And that's like an indirect path. Because one of the options that you could share with was the notes pad. Yeah, right. Which is what right. I wanted to do because I wanted to use it on, on my uh, Mac OS machine. Right. Yeah, very cool. Cool. You know, uh, John, also in 676, I believe because you mentioned it, we were talking about moving things around on your screen and we mentioned Stay, the app that, uh, that will keep Windows where they belong. And... Bob, Dr. Bob wrote in and he said, here's another way to keep your windows where you would like them on one or more screens. Use Moom, M-O-O-M, from Many Tricks. He says, for example, I usually want my 15-inch built-in display to look a certain way while I'm working on other stuff on my 27-inch screen. When the Mac messes up those windows, or I do, he says, I can use my Moom shortcut to put them back where I like them lickety-split. 
You can save as many custom window layouts as you like. While it also does a bunch of other stuff with Windows, I'd pay for this feature alone. It's 10 bucks and worth it. ManyTricks.com slash Moom. And uh, yeah, Moom, actually, uh, ManyTricks is... Uh, one of the people involved with many tricks is Rob Griffiths, who brought us Mac OS 10 hints dot com, the site that uh, for many years brought us all those hints that we came to know and love. Certainly one of my favorite sites back in the day. So, yeah, we'll put a link to that in the show notes for sure. Very good. Right, John? Absolutely. We're moving it along. All right. Uh, in a few episodes ago, in episode 673, we were discussing connecting remotely to another Mac and uh, listener Mark said, you know, VNC connect from real VNC.com does this too. And it has an iOS app and it's free for up to five computers and you can do it remotely and connect and all of that good stuff. So if you want a way to connect back to your Macs from your uh, iPad and you want to be able to do it for free, that is the way to do it. So thanks so much for that, Mark. We will put a link to that in the show notes too. It's pretty good. I always forget about that one. Have you used that one? Uh, I have a VNC something client on my on my phone. And yeah, that's right. Because underneath it all, the remote access that Apple uses is standards based. Right. But the difference is just for people that are, are paying attention here is that VNC Connect is allows you to connect from outside your network too. It, it does the whole firewall piercing negotiation thing. Ah, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then kind of slipping into, to more traditional cool stuff found category. Although really this one is a, um, a follow up to a previous one. Listener Joe, a few months ago suggested a piece of software called duplicati, uh, that was a free backup software, a uh, piece of backup software for your Mac. Dupl Duplicacy, D-U-P-L-I-C-A-C-Y, is his new favorite because he found some issues with Duplicati. So, uh, so Duplicacy has its cross-platform Mac, Linux, Windows. There's command line versions. Uh, it can dedupe across multiple machine backups. So if you have, say, uh, let's say your documents folder synced to multiple Macs or your Dropbox folder synced to multiple Macs, it will notice that it is backing up the same file uh, from multiple machines and it will dedupe that out, thinning down the amount of space that your backup takes. It's got some other cool things, too. We will put a link to that in the show notes. So thanks for, for that, Joe. It's at duplicacy.com. And I... I'm glad that I don't have to say that word anymore because it's, it's not easy. <laughs> Duplicacy, John. There you go. Now I've got it. It's in there just like Mac Geek Gab. That's one of those things. People try to say it. And the first time anybody says it, they just stop and stumble. It's like, yep, yeah, you got to work that Duplicacy. one out. Duplicacy. Duplicacy. Yeah. See what I mean? It's kind of fun to say, isn't it? Oh, anyway. No. <laughs> Duplicacy is fun to say. No, never mind. That's a back to the old. Kids ask your parents about the underoos commercial. Uh, listener Greg, please. He says, uh, let's see, where is Greg here? Greg, actually, we've got two from Greg. And so we will start with the correct one. Greg says, uh, I have two cool stuff found. And really now he's got three. Inbox by Gmail. Uh, it's an app called Inbox. It's from Google. So it's called inbox by Gmail. And he says, uh, it's a great app for keeping your inbox clean and organized. You can bundle certain types of emails or bundle from certain senders and it groups them together in the inbox. Also, there's an easy way to snooze emails and choose exactly when you want them to come back. You could also create bundles in the inbox and choose which types of emails or senders should go in that bundle. Very, very cool. He says, uh, it's kind of the thing that keeps his email sane. And uh, we can appreciate that. So we were talking about sane box on a previous show. And now we've got inbox from Google working to do the same thing, collecting your email, managing reminders. These are, these are important things. Uh, and then the second one is called text grabber. He says, sometimes on my iPhone or iPad, I would like to copy 
and paste text from somewhere, but that text is on, uh, it is not selectable. This, with this application, you can take a screenshot of it and then use the app to OCR it very quickly and select the text. He says it works great. It sounds funky, but it works great. He says, so when you can't select text because the website makes it really difficult, I think we've all been there, especially on the phone, uh, you're trying to select text and the thing jumps all over the place, screenshot it, run it through text grabber. And it will turn it around and make it, it'll OCR the text. So it's, I mean, it's, it's crazy that we're taking this text that's there, taking it as a picture, turning it back into text, but in an easily selectable form. So text grabber, that's pretty good, Greg. And then Greg writes in with one more, um, and he calls this one Pika text, P-I-C-A-T-E-X-T. T E X T. Sorry. Uh, he says, I know I told you about text grabber. This one is for the Mac and it's a great little app. Many times I want to copy and paste things on my Mac, but it's not selectable. So you can create a keyboard shortcut to drag a specific area on your screen and it will quickly and accurately OCR it. Pikatext.com. He said, I found out from uh, about this one from Don McAllister over at screencasts online. We love Don. So look at that. I, I like this concept of, screenshot and then OCR it. And it, again, it seems so backwards and inefficient to do things that way, but when it works, if it works. What do you think, John? Yeah, it's a hack, but it works. It's a hack. That's it. That's the beauty of hacks, right? All right. As long and, as it doesn't involve stone knives or bear skins. Well, yeah. Is there a problem with stone knives though? I mean, if they, if they work to get the job done, <laughs> Okay. Uh, we think we're almost done with the cool stuff found here, but we've got a couple more. And, uh, and let's see, I'm looking for listener Don who writes, I'm a big fan of the Thunderbolt interface uh, and own several Thunderbolt drives, including a couple of the now discontinued Seagate Thunderbolt GoFlex uh, adapters. Recently, I was able to find a Thunderbolt dual bay storage dock, the Rocket Store 52512 that allows quick mounting and dismounting of two external hard drives of either size. It has two flaws, however. The first it is that it has to be the last Thunderbolt device in the chain, even though it has its own power supply. The second is that it is only a Thunderbolt 1 device. Despite those flaws, I've found the device to be quite handy to use for cloning my IMAX hard drive and just mounting other drives that, uh, that need to be there. And, uh, and I did, I found this thing on Amazon. It's, uh, it's 150 bucks, maybe 148. And so we will put a link to that in the show notes for sure. It's called the, uh, rocket store, uh, 5212. But, uh, you know, I, this is not a unique concept. There are a few other things that do this. And honestly, there, there's two of them from OWC. They have, a Thunderbolt one, but it's a Thunderbolt two uh, device, a Thunderbolt two version of this. And that retails for two sixty over there. But they also have a USB three uh, version of this and really, and that one's 70 bucks. And, and just to be clear, what this is, is it, they are a box that sits on your desktop and you can drop a drive down into it. it you don't need a case. You don't need anything. You just take the raw bare metal drive plug it in. It's got SATA ports in it and it just spins the drive up I and mean, you get to turn it on and then it spins the drive up and mounts it. And you're right there. And as uh, Don mentioned, all of these things that we've mentioned here have two bays. So not only could you copy to or from your Mac, you could just use the device kind of by itself along with your Mac to copy data between two bare metal drives or, or eat, or if you need to fix a drive, if you've got a drive that needs to be scanned or repaired, this is a great way to do it. Cause you don't have to put it in a case. And, and really the, the USB three one for most of you and most of what you would do with it is going to be super fine. And for 70 bucks, you know, there you go. All right. Do you have one of these things, John? No, but I'll tell you what I do have, Dave, because I was just using it and you saw me using it when you were over because I was erasing a mechanical yeah. drive that had just failed on me and uh, I wanted to do a secure erase on it. So I use the newer tech universal drive adapter Yep. that uh, 
The uni- it's a USB 3 thing, right? USB Same concept. USB 3 to yep. a couple of different drive types. Uh, in this case, SATA uh, is what I had. Yep. But it'll connect to older types as well. And uh, for $34.75, um, it, it's not pretty. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a bunch of wires sitting around. I that's mean, you're not, that's you're, 25 cents less than 35 bucks, folks, folks just to make to make it clear. Yeah. $34.75 is the price. Yeah. Every quarter counts. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Well, it's not $3,500. It's 35 bucks. Like, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Handy yeah. stuff. And and something like this is almost a necessity in any geek's ars- arsenal. I find the the docks really convenient at, at home, at my desk or whatever. And I leave my um, my universal drive adapter in a sort of a carry bag if I need to go somewhere and help somebody out or whatever. I've always got it. And it's it's right there. So, yes, yes. Good stuff. Yeah. Time to move on, Mr. Braun. Move it on. Moving on up. Yep. Beans don't he burn said. on the grill. <laughs> uh, OK. <laughs> you know what we're talking about? You're old. Yes, that's right. Uh, okay, I know, I know, we've got something here, but I don't see it, and so I'm just going to move on. You want to take us to Mister X, there, John? Ooh, um, yeah, this is a follow up. So the and and a clarification of of sorts here. So a person that would rather not have us use their name, so we're going to call him Mister X, wrote in and said. Print dialog not showing all options. Uh, from, this is from airport. the last episode, a follow-up from episode 676. Yeah. Right, where someone was not getting all the options they were expecting with their uh, with their print dialog, and that sucks, and I suggest that it could be uh, they select an airprint driver. So what it said here is, it may not be airprint. Can they see these options, the print options, uh, that is, in some applications but not in others, assuming they're using the manufacturer's print driver, of course. There was a change in 10.12.4 where some applications would not load a third-party print driver, which means that the manufacturer-specific options will not appear when printing from these apps. I first noticed this in Safari, personally. Unfortunately, there's no workaround. It's AirPrint or Bust. Also, to nitpick a little, AirPrint is a driverless printing protocol. Emoji. Mocking me, I think. or No. Oh, sticking out. Okay. Um, and we're not going to use their name. So, that's the follow-up. Uh Try another app to print your stuff. <laughs> that seems lame, doesn't it? It does, but it's good to know <laughs> that that's, uh, that's how it works. All right, cool. Thanks, Mr. X. Always appreciate that sort of follow-up. Very, very good stuff. Uh, from Andrew, a tip. With the new iPhones just being announced, I thought I'd share a quick phone tip that I didn't know before I tested it. If you get a call, you can stop the ringing or the buzzing with one tap on the sleep-wake button on the right side of most phones. But you can still answer the call until the caller hangs up or until it goes to voicemail. But it was the two-tap action I didn't know until now. A second tap after the first, or two quick taps, will send your caller right to voicemail, unless your voicemail is full. And I think a lot of people's voicemail is full, but they don't know it. Uh, So a second tip, if you delete some voicemails, be sure to clear them by scrolling to the bottom of the voicemail screen on the iPhone. Click on deleted messages and clear all. So two phone tips in one there from Andrew. Thank you so much, man. That's um, that's handy. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That double tap thing is is good. I've done it by mistake where I'll, you know, my phone's in my pocket and it starts ringing and I'll hit the button once to pull it out and see who it is. And maybe I'll answer it. Maybe not. And I wind up hitting it a second time and it's like, oh, phew, gone. Oh, well, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. Right? Good, John? I just hit the red button because if I don't know who you are, then stop. Well, yeah, but but this is for if the phone's in your pocket making noise, right? You can't see the red button. So, yeah. Uh, in our Facebook group at MacGeekGab.com slash Facebook, David says uh, he reminds us all of Bartender 2 at MacBartender.com, one of our favorite apps. Uh, actually, it's Bartender 3 now. Uh, I guess when it when it was posted in the Facebook group or when I grabbed the, uh, the screenshot of it, it was Bartender 2. But uh, it is high Sierra ready. And what Bartender does is it lets you collapse your menu bar. We all look. 
we're geeks, right? I mean, if we're listening to the show, we're either geeks or we want to learn how to be geeks or we want to learn what geeks do. And all of that winds up with us installing lots of things on our Mac, sometimes to test out and sometimes they live there long term. A lot of those things want to fit in your menu bar. And depending on how wide your screen is, they might not all fit in your menu bar. That's what bartenders for. It allows you to put things in the little bartender bar that you can drop down below your menu bar to keep your menu bar clean and pristine, but also have quick access to all of those cool things that you need. And one of the cool things that bartender can do is it can jump something up. It can promote something from the hidden bartender bar up to the main menu bar if there's activity. So, for example, you've got Dropbox, right? When there's activity, Dropbox's menu bar icon changes. Well, that can cause it to be promoted up for, say, 30 seconds. And then when activity stops, it pops back down again. So very, very cool app. It's one of those things. It's perfect for cool stuff found because it's the kind of thing that I forget exists because I rely on it so much, if that makes any sense at all. So go ahead and check it out. We'll put a link in the show notes to... Uh, but good old bartender. We love it. You use bartender, John? No, but I should because I've been running into that exact problem because I'm starting to put too much stuff in my menu bar and I just can't. <laughs> and I just don't have the discipline to remove the things that I don't. It's like, well, I may need to use that. So if you don't have the discipline to, uh, you know, manage those properly, then you need something like this. That's totally it. Yeah, right. It, it totally allows you to punt on being a disciplined uh, app runner. I mean, but what I do is I quit the app that, is frontmost and try to switch to another one that takes up less menu bar space. So I see, so you see the remainder the of, of the thing bar. that was hidden before. Yeah, that's bad. That's bad. I, I do the same thing, but, but it works. Yeah, it totally you usually works. go to finder. It has, yeah. it, it typically doesn't take up Finder's much pretty, uh, real estate in the menu bar. <laughs> pretty compressed. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. And then, uh, also on Facebook listener, Daniel, uh, points us to he actually asked a question out there on Facebook, but his issue was this. He says, I'm running a MacBook Pro 2017 and just now the Wi-Fi started to go nuts. I've been having problems the last couple of hours. The computer won't connect to any Wi-Fi, but my iPhone can connect. No problem. Sometimes the Mac will connect and either it doesn't get access or it's terribly slow and it disconnects after a couple of minutes. What's going on? And some discussion ensued. And somebody stumbled on to the answer and said, USB three and Wi-Fi don't play nice to together, especially five gigahertz Wi-Fi. And uh, we've talked about that on the show before, but it is important to remember as soon as he disconnected his USB three drive from his computer, uh, it fixed it. And then he moved his USB three drive to the right side of uh, his MacBook Pro, which can help quite a bit uh, in these 2017 MacBook Pros. Evidently, uh, the left side is closer to that Wi-Fi antenna, or at least it was for, for everybody that was talking about it and moving it around to the right side uh, tends to solve that issue. So there you go. It's a proximity thing, right, John? You've dealt with this before. I really haven't told you the truth. Oh, I thought you had. Okay. I know we've talked I mean, I about know, it before. Yeah. I mean, I know of the theory where, it's like, okay, well, USB 3 operates at this frequency. So, um, right. It, it was like, who thought? They're like, hey, let's take, you know, some new thing and make sure that it operates at a frequency that's that's a multiple of something that's really common already. What a right. great idea. It's like, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. Hey, I want to take a second and thank our premium subscribers for this week. And also, I want to mention, you know, we talked about it a couple of shows ago that we were going to be changing our credit card provider. And that unfortunately meant that uh, anybody on an auto renew plan with the credit card would need to update your credit card in our system. That time has come. In fact, it has now passed in that if you haven't updated your credit card and, and the system tries to charge you, it won't work. We we thought things were bad with our provider until we started digging in. And we found out they were worse. So uh, so we just we 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 made a clean cut actually earlier today from them. So our apologies for uh, having to put you through that and our thanks for 
all of you that already have done it. I sent out emails to everybody that uh, that was affected by it that was going to be renewing this week just to get things kind of rolling. The rest of you will get emails from us uh, about it, but just know that's what's that's what's going on. All you have to do is log into your account at uh, macobserver.com slash shop or macgeekup.com slash premium. And uh, and ba- basically you just, you know, say change payment type and you're just going to change it back to a credit card and you'll be fine. Or you can change to PayPal if you want. E- either one works great for us. So whatever works for you works for us. And thank you for that. And so uh, without further ado, some folks that deserve some thanks that uh, contributed this week. A one-time $50 payment from Ralph L. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Everybody in the monthly $10 plan that renewed this week, Ken L., Everett T., Nick S., Elizabeth B., easy for me to say, David B., Thomas S., Bob P., Ward J., Michael L., Dave C., Ken L., Jason A., Chris F., Jim E., thank you so much to all of you. And then folks on the biannual plan, which is generally 25 bucks every six months. Mike Z, Andrew B, Robert A, Fernando F, David H, but not me. Uh, Lyndon N, Andrew S, Lee F, James H, Roger Y, Randy B, Robert R, John G, Ulysses B, Keith K, Mario Z, Michael D, Sharon F, and then... uh, Lee F and Martin S both are bumped up to uh, 50 bucks every six months. So thank you so much to all of you. You rock. And many of you in there have gone through and, and dealt with the issue of, of migrating your cards over. It's, it's worked well. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. We couldn't do the show without you. Anything to say about that, John, before I, uh, <clears throat> before I move us along? Thank here? you each and every one. There we are. Yeah. Consideration. It's awesome. Support. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, you know what, while we're here, I want to, I want to talk quickly about our sponsors. If, uh, if that works for you, Mr. Braun. Dandy. All right. Our first sponsor today is a new sponsor for Mac Geek, uh, but not a new product or company by any stretch. I am pleased to welcome Plex as our first sponsor today. Plex is what I use to manage my entire media library. You've heard me talk about it on the show before, but all of my movies are in there and I can play them anywhere. I can stream them to anywhere I want, to any device, movies, TV shows, music, photos, all of it can be stored inside Plex. That's what I do. And then when I want to play something, I just go ahead and play it. You can stream and share all your personal media to any device right from your Plex media server. You can run a Plex media server on your Mac. You can run it on your Synology. You you can run it on your Drobo network device. It's built to do exactly what you want to do. And it is built by people that want to do exactly what you want to do, which means it just works. And now you can get personalized video news from some of the most trusted sources on the planet right in with your own media. And of course, if you don't want news, you don't have to get that. You can just watch your movies or your TV shows, whatever you want. It lets you organize it. It automatically organizes it. Really, that's kind of the cool thing. Manages subtitles, manages different audio types. They've got an Apple TV app, so you just launch the app on your Apple TV. It connects to your Plex server. It can connect to your friend's Plex server across the Internet if you guys choose to share together. Beautiful, easy to use. And then if you visit Plex.tv, everything I've talked about so far is free, right? Free. Go to Plex.tv. Get it. However, they do have a Plex Pass, right? And the Plex Pass adds things like mobile sync. So you can download to your iPhone or your iPad and watch on an airplane. You can upload your photos right from your phone to store in there. You can do DVR and live TV, and you can get a free month of a Plex Pass subscription if you go to plex.tv slash redeem and use coupon code MGG. Again, Go to Plex.tv, sign up, download the server, install it, manage your library, all of that stuff. Totally free. And I encourage you to do that. And then when you're ready, 
To get a Plex Pass, go to plex.tv slash redeem, use code MGG, and you'll remember that because, you know, it's MGG. And then you can get uh, the first month for free. So go try it out. Our thanks to Plex for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for this episode is also a longtime friend of Matt Geekab, Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, the new URL from them, where you this month can learn all about the PDF Pen family, particularly the new PDF Pen 3 for iPad and iPhone. PDF Pen lets you edit PDFs like the pro that you are all with the same family of apps. PDF Pen for Mac OS, ultimate PDF editing tool. It's like your Swiss Army knife for PDFs, right? PDF Scan Plus, possibly my favorite app in the bunch, although they really all do just work together. PDF Pen Scan Plus allows you to use your iPhone as a scanner, a mobile scanner. I talk about it all the time. I did a theater show this weekend. I needed to scan the book in. In five minutes, I scanned a hundred page book in as a PDF and then could manipulate it any way I want. I could write all over it because I didn't have to write all over the actual book. I was just doing it on my iPad. I could turn in the book at the end of the show and it was clean and pristine because I scanned my own copy in, did my little notes and edits there. So awesome. And then the new PDF Pen 3 for iPad and iPhone combines all those PDF tools with the new iOS 11 files infrastructure, making it incredibly easy to access all your files from a variety of sources, including places like Dropbox, Google Drive, and really anything that you can reach with Transmit. It, it's it, the, the new files thing and apps that tap into it. It's so cool. So you got to check it out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Learn all about the PDF pen family. Download the ones that make sense to you. It's awesome. Again, that's smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Go get all the PDF pen stuff. You're going to love it. Our thanks to Smile for sponsoring this episode. It's time for High Sierra, John. That's what we're going to next. How's that sound? Oh, boy. Why, oh, boy. Oh, no, we're We're good. (laughs) Okay. We're there. I'm there. You're there, right? Yeah, I've been uh, I've been actually very happy with High Sierra. But there some people have had a few issues. Some people have had some cool things and that's what we're uh, that's what we're doing next year. So next year, not next year. Maybe next year, but but currently right now we'll do it too. Listener Paul uh, writes in and he says, "Okay. So we got a lot to talk about here." Uh, first, he says I don't remember what episode it was you talked about Clam XAV, but this is a great piece of software that allows you to scan on demand and enable real-time scans if you want. Just as a follow-up, John was correct. You have to configure the sentry piece of the software to enable real-time scans, but you tell it what you want to monitor. I have mine set up to monitor downloads, file, uh, email folders, my browser cache, and where I copy files from a server to my local machine. On average, it uses just like 20 megs of RAM and really isn't a problem. Okay, that's uh, thank you for the update to Clamex AV. That's that's important. I wanted to make sure we got that right. Um, he also notes we're getting to the high Sierra thing, but, you know, we'll get there. Number number two out of three is he says with iTunes 12.7 being released, I've been using iMazing more and more. The cool thing I found is that you can sleep restart and shut down an iOS device from the main app. My son hates that. He says, I, I never realized that it's right there in the options, but I never used it. Did you, have you ever checked that out, John with iMazing make it sleep the screen and do all that cool stuff. Restart uh, right from there. No, I know it's right there. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's right there. And then finally, a not so cool thing found with high Sierra He says, with macOS High Sierra, Apple has removed two features from Terminal that I use on a daily basis. He says, I used to use both Telnet and FTP. Uh, Telnet's a quick and easy way to see if a TCP port is open and listening. Even if you're not going to use Telnet to connect to a remote server, it can still be a very handy thing to see if, say, you know, if you do Telnet uh, www.macobserver.com space 80, uh, that's a good way to see if our server is answering on the web port. But they removed Telnet. Same thing with FTP. They removed it. It does not exist in High Sierra. Uh, he says you can copy those files from user bin on a uh, on a 10.12 on a Sierra machine. You can copy them over and they'll run. Uh, that's fine. But 
there's two problems with that. Really one big one. They won't necessarily be kept. In fact, they definitely won't be kept up to date because you're copying them over. Uh, they might also be blown away by a future OS update. But I have a better solution for you. If you're going to be messing around in the terminal, as we geeks like to do, highly recommend you install a package manager to control all the things that you're going to use in the terminal, the extra things you're going to use. And now FTP and Telnet are extra. That's all. So with Homebrew, uh, I was able to go and type brew space install space Telnet, T-E-L-N-E-T, -E press return, and it installed the High Sierra Telnet package that's part of the brew, the brew repository. Everything works fine. Uh, and it will keep that up to date. Anytime you update brew, it will update that package. Now for FTP, it's slightly different because there is no package simply named FTP in brew. You need to install one of the variety of FTP packages that's there. Years ago, I started using one called NCFTP. And sure enough, you can type brew install NCFTP and it will install that. But if you don't like NCFTP, you can do brew search FTP. And it will show you all of the packages with the word with the characters FTP in it. And you can pick one that you like and install that and then use that. And again, it will be kept up to date by Brew. So, yes, Telnet and FTP went away, but they're not that far away. You can come and get them back and and really actually get a better experience too, especially the, the different FTP clients. So that's my thought on that, John. What do you think? One, I use Cake Brew, which I'm trying to do right now to see if I can find a Telnet client, but it's updating itself because I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's taking it forever. There you go. <clears throat> anyways, should people, should we really encourage people to keep using Telnet and FTP because they're horribly insecure? On the other hand, they're really handy to debug low level file transfer and right. socket issues. Yeah. Like I would use Telnet to debug mail servers. You just exactly. tell them at port 25 and then just, you know, it's, yeah. it's in plain text. Well, you cannot, not anymore because be. it's all in TLS now, but, um, but you used to be able to do that. Yeah. You can certainly see if the server's answering. Yeah. 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 That's kind of fun sometimes. Generate yeah. some raw HTML. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. No, it's totally handy. Having that around is, is an important thing. So I, I was, can understand why they remove it. I guess, I, you know, I, I can understand. Like I said, I don't know if I teach today's young people to use those tools. Let's, let's just stop. <laughs> no, I would totally teach people to use those tools for exactly the reasons we're talking about. Where, <laughs> where Telnet becomes potentially a problem, and really only potentially, is when you're running a Telnet server where you're actually just connecting in clear text to a terminal session on another computer. But that's not... Um, you know, that's not the only thing you would use Telnet for. In fact, it's probably one of the least common things people would use it for. Oh, yeah, in the case you use SSH. Right, right, exactly. So I wouldn't necessarily install a Telnet daemon on a, on a computer anymore, but to have the Telnet client package, really handy. But yeah. but also, yeah, yeah. local on a local network where you control everything, then maybe sending in the clear isn't so bad. But still, I mean, SSH is right there, so I would use that instead. Anyway. There you go. Thanks, Paul. Hopefully that helps Paul and uh, enough of you. Don found a very strange issue, and I, I would love to hear from others if you've experienced the same. Don said, after installing Hi Sierra on my 2015 iMac, I created a bootable USB installer for it to use on my MacBook Pro, late 2011 MacBook Pro. I booted the MacBook Pro from the USB installer. I use disk utility as part of the installer to erase the internal SSD and I reformatted it as APFS. I wanted to do a clean install. I figured that was the best way to do it. I then tried to install High Sierra on the SSD. It did not work. The installation would go on for six or eight minutes and the computer would reboot using the High Sierra installer thumb drive. Disk utility would show that nothing had been installed on the SSD. After some angst, I thought maybe the target drive had to be formatted in HFS plus for it to work properly. I launched disk utility from the thumb drive, but it wouldn't allow me to format SSD and HFS plus only APFS was available. What to do? I booted my MacBook pro from my latest super duper clone and using Sierra's disk utility. I reformatted the computer's SSD using HFS plus. 
I rebooted the MacBook from High Sierra thumb drive, had it install High Sierra without reformatting the SSD ahead of time. Success. And it migrated my drive to S- to APFS in the process. So this, I, I, I would, like I said, I would love to hear from others because in what, what Don writes here would then imply that if you needed to wipe your Sierra, your high Sierra Mac clean, say six months from now and reinstall it, it wouldn't work because the drive is APFS. And I find that hard to believe, but I don't, I mean, I don't think Don's lying to us. I think what he experienced is what he told us. So the question is why was it APFS that was causing the problem or was there something else about the way that drive was formatted that high Sierra didn't like? Interesting, huh, John? Yeah, I I, I noticed some, well, maybe not totally mind-blowing, but yeah, it, 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 in one of the betas, it got very picky about the format that it wanted a certain drive in, and it would just say, no, I'm not going to accept this other option that you want me to do. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some of that's left over. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Mine was smooth sailing. I think it took about, uh, on both machines, I have uh, one terabyte SSDs. And I think it took like 40 minutes because it was converting to the new file system. I yeah, it does take some it. time. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was longer than usual, but it was doing a whole file system conversion. So, all right, <laughs> I'll cut you some Which is like jack. magic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. You had... seems to work with everything else, but uh, continue. No, well, why don't you continue? You had some tips about uh, High Sierra you wanted to share. Oh, I don't know if it's necessarily a tip. Um, well, I'm going to give you the tip because here's what happened on one of my machines. So it was funny because at first I thought that maybe High Sierra was doing some interesting menu bar op- uh, optimization. Because after I upgraded one of my machines, it happened on my MacBook Pro, but not on my Mac Mini. Uh, I rebooted and I'm like, wow, there's relatively less things in the menu bar. That's kind of strange. Where'd they all go? <laughs> so I went to uh, System Preferences. Um uh, Users and groups, uh, my user, and I went to login items, and there were none. <laughs> really? It's like, what? Huh. I don't know if it was a UI bug, but uh, and I'm like, all right, well, let's restart. You know, maybe it's just yeah. like old data or something. But, you know, I went back, and same thing. It's like, there's nothing there, man. Huh. So some things started up because they're not based on a login item. But a lot of things, you know, it's not right or wrong. You know, Dropbox and... Uh, Google Drive, uh, you know, a lot of things yeah. have some sort of agent or something that's, you know, it's 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 actually probably a, a better way of launching things for the user than hiding it because the user right. can see it and disable it if they want to. Right. But um, it's like, well, now what do I do? It's like, well, it just got like blown away. I mean, so I, oh, well, I made a backup before I, I uh, upgraded. So uh, why don't we boot from the backup and take some screenshots of those screens and put it in Dropbox and then access it from the other machine. <laughs> huh. I had to manually add things back. Yeah. Well, some, in, in some cases it was like, okay, the app itself, a lot of times will have in its preferences saying launch it startup. So I'm like, okay, let me give it a chance to make things right. Sure. Sure. But that was the only Kiwi, Kiwi Graham in the chat room says the same thing. Launch agents. Uh, sorry. Uh, his login items on his MacBook pro gone after huh. the high Sierra upgrade. Yeah. So you're not alone. Yeah, but easy enough if you have a backup um, and a way to send yourself screenshots. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. And I get a weird screen when it starts up. It's like everything looks normal, and all of a sudden the screen it's like in negative. It's like somebody turned all, everything in reverse, and then it's just like totally black background, and then there's just like a gray bar marching along, and then it goes back to the normal screen, and it's like what? I even did a reinstall. I'm like, you know, maybe something got glitched during the install. That caused that problem too, but huh. I know it's pretty smooth. Um, what did we miss? The only thing that I don't know. I guess we got to wait for him. <laughs> but Drive Genius said, "Well, we're going to upgrade the program to not work because we're not quite compatible yet." And it's sure. Like, Aw. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, but all my other apps, pretty much. Uh, I mean, how, how about? How, I mean, it, you know, it's I'm st- even though this is a new file system. Well, you know, we've had it on our iOS mm-hmm. devices for a while. Um, right. Since iOS 10, I guess they introduced 10.3. 10, uh, 10. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So not right at 10. No, but, you know, all my NAS devices that are formatted 
you know, the way they were, it seems everything's working. My backups and stuff still work. Well, there's not so, sure if so that my, I, I want to stop right there because that there's I've heard a lot of people confused about the, the thing you just said, where, look, you know, that drive over the network over there is working OK with APFS. Not that there's there's literally no correlation there. Oh, I know well, what I was saying. I, no, no, is no, 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 no. I, I know you know that. But but the fact that you related them here, I just want to make sure we don't get people confused. APFS is only for your local drives and only a subset of them uh, for now. Uh, the You know, the boot drive, it has to be SSD, et cetera, et cetera. You can force other drives to, to convert to APFS, but that's what's going to happen. Your NAS drive, anything, any kind of network drive, even if it's on another Mac, does not will not be changed to APFS by your Mac. It will only be changed by that device over there. So if if you upgrade another Mac on your network to APFS, sure, then that'll get upgraded uh, if it should, you know, according to the same criteria. But your NAS isn't going to change format. And I just wanted to make sure that was clear for folks because yeah. I've, I've had well, some What they're using like is, yeah. in all likelihood, a network protocol, be it AFP or SMB or maybe some other weird ones if right. you're into that sort of thing. But um. That's pretty much what you're using with the NAS. Um, well, my well only hang question, on, hang on. You're confusing people again because you're confusing the protocol that you use to talk across the network with the format of the drive over there. So well, I think you I'm could, making them as distinct. Uh, right. But you could have a, a your NAS could you the, forget about a NAS. Another Mac, right, could have an HFS drive or an APFS drive. And you're mm. still going to use AFP across the network, Apple file protocol, or more likely SMB. Uh, what is it? Yes. S something, something messaging blocks. Server no. message. Server. Block. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't yeah, even yeah. know what they call that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But that, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two separate things. Yeah. I found an now, interesting. One, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm going to guess. So the thing is, last I checked, my carbon copy cloner clone is a HFS drive. That would make sense. Now, yeah. data has been copied over since I upgraded. Yes. The root, and I suspect that it'll boot just fine because nothing about its bootability has changed. If I want to reformat it with the new file system, then I'd have to start from scratch, I gather. That's correct. Yeah. Well, yeah. Could you, I mean, in theory, you should be able to convert that, though. It, it, obviously, your Mac has All right. The I capability. think this utility, uh, yes, I've heard, well, it's a rotational drive. I'm not sure. I found the conversion didn't work on a rotational drive, okay. even though it should have. The last okay. time I tried, they may have fixed the utility. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, no, yeah. it was buried in disutility. I thought somewhere. I thought our own uh, John um, Martellero wrote something about that. Yeah, at that point. that's right. He did. He found the uh, the magic there. That's right. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, good. Keeping everything uh, straight and honest and all that good stuff. Okay. Uh I did find something interesting. I went, uh, we run QuickBooks here and QuickBooks makes a backup every time uh, you quit or anytime you do an operation that's going to make substantive changes to the data file or anything like that. And after I had upgraded to High Sierra, I quit QuickBooks and it didn't, it, the backup failed. I'm like, ah, that's kind of weird. And, uh, and then I tried again and the backup failed. And so I did some searching. It turns out that commas in the name of a disk image, which happens a lot with QuickBooks data, because you'll have a company named, say, the Mac Observer, comma, space, Inc., or Backbeat Media, comma, space, LLC. Like, that's a pretty common way, way of doing that. And the file name is named automatically when you put your business name in. It, it like, it, High Sierra doesn't like it. And it's not just High Sierra. I think there's... There were some people even on Sierra that were having this problem too, but definitely APFS uh, does not like commas in the, um, or may, and maybe it's not APFS, maybe it's just High Sierra, but uh, does not like commas in the file name of a disk image and it will fail to create it if you try to do that. So save yourself from, you know, having to, to awesome. dig through the weeds to find that answer. Just change the name of your QuickBooks files. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. So anyway. Yeah. Let's use a character. I, I don't know. Just, like, just don't use a comma. 
Well, but it, I mean, the, but the thing is, commas have worked for decades. Oh, you should decades. be able to. I agree. Right. It's just like it's a it's a character that means different things it, to different correct. pieces correct. of software. Yep. One will be like, hey, that's a data delimiter. Okay, let me make more of these. Right. <laughs> right. Like right. the file system. It's like, wait, what are you asking me to do here? It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, you want to talk about partitioning USB flash drives from Greg to here, John? Oh, boy, do oh, I. Oh, boy. All right, let's do it. Once I get that up in front of me here, so let's see, Greg. All right, well, I got something for Greg, I hope. So it's something that Apple keeps doing to us, and, and we're just going to have to deal with it. Um, now I have the squeaky chair. What happened here, John? I've unsqueaked. I don't know. I think it's getting more humid, so it fixed the, the squeaky factor here. But um, huh. All right. So anyways, Greg says, I got a question for you guys about partitioning external USB flash drives. Starting with OS X Lion, I've been buying 8-gig flash drives every year to create beautiful installers for each new release of OS X, now Mac OS. I now have quite a collection of these USB drives, and this week I figured a more economical and efficient way to do this would be to buy one large flash drive, partition it in 8-gig volumes, and put the different installers on the different partitions. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, so I bought a monster 128-gig Samsung USB 3 flash drive on Amazon. For less than forty dollars? Wow. Um, thinking I could breeze right through this. Wrong. My Mac is running Mac OS uh, High Sierra public release, not the beta. All right. And although Disutility saw the flash drive and let me reformat it as an HFS plus volume, the partition button is grayed out, preventing me from partitioning this drive. Any suggestions on a partition this? What's the question? Any suggestions on how to partition? Got it this USB flash drive. Yes. And we suggested it earlier. Dave, Dave was kind of leading into this, I think in, in his own sneaky way. But um, I don't know about you, Dave, but I found that Apple often removes features from the GUI that are available. If you just know more than, you know, now. And what do I mean by that? That's fair. I like that. Yeah, you. Oh, the answer is clear. You if know you what I was going to say? More than, you know, now I was That's trying right. to be like, Okay, yeah. I probably shouldn't say what I'm thinking. I should. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. That's good. I was going to say you don't know what you're doing, but that's that's not a nice way of putting it. No, I, I like the way information. you put it. You just lack information. That's it. Yeah, the answer is easy if you know it. <laughs> I mean, a lot of times, right? Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of times for Apple Utilities, there's a, a, a command line version that you can access from the terminal. Right. So, of course, there's something called disk utility. Well, if you go to the terminal... And you type disutil. Well, you're going to get a, it's going to barf out a whole thing of uh, the format of the various commands. But that's what it's called at the command line. And what is it? It is disutility with maybe some more options. Now you ask it for the options. Well, one thing you could do, Dave, is you could say man space disutil. And it's going to give you all the options. <clears throat> So actually, if you just a, type disk util, yeah, that might give you that that gives you a nice synopsis. That's a brief. Of, yeah. Well, I think that's the syntax of all the commands without too much fluff. Man yeah. you, it hits you with, you know, both barrels. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But what you want is there because I looked in there and I'm like, well, let me see if what I want is in there. And yes, there is a disutil command. So it's disutil space partition disk with a capital D, all the rest being small. Space, and then I said stuff, because it's way too complex to talk about right now. Wouldn't it be great if some nice person out there wrote up a little tutorial on how to do disutility partitioning with multiple partitions? And someone did, Dave. And the head of the section on the set I'm going to refer to is called Multiple, multiple Partitioning, and it's called Dismanage It From The Command Line at theinstructional.com. Thanks, guys. Or wherever that came from. But uh, that's the site. So that'll show you how to do it from the command line. And uh, it, it's not too complex. I mean, as long as you know the format of things and the size of things that you want, and I think it'll even automatically divvy it up, just like a utility, if, if you ask it to. So, I mean, that's all I got, other than use someone else's utility. But if this utility isn't seeing it, you know? Yeah. I mean, off top, I mean, I, I would say this, you know, yeah, that's genius, it. but it's not running nope. now so drive genius don't won't run in high sierra <laughs> yet that's right yeah so what uh, have you tried any of the other um uh, you know other than command line magic but what other 
Have you have you run any of your major dicks? No. Disc maintenance or fix it utilities under high Sierra to see how they work. No, I haven't. And that's actually a good thing to do this week. I was, I was out of the office most of last week. So, um, I didn't get to do all that fun stuff that I would usually do. Yeah. You were like in the mountains and the prairies and. Oh dude. And I even saw you, but no, I didn't get to do that. So we shall do that this week. Yep. Yep. All right. Good stuff. Um, let's jump and do some iOS 11 stuff. We've got some time left. Uh, the first thing, actually, the first thing we'll talk about is something listener Patrick was asking. He said he wanted to bulk delete a bunch of apps from uh, his iPhone, and he used to use iTunes to do that, but he can't anymore. And really, with that, the magic answer is to use uh, iMazing, uh, because you can just highlight, multiple, once you get your phone connected, either wired or wirelessly, you can just highlight a bunch of apps right there inside iMazing, uh, tell it to delete. It'll delete the app and the data, and it's just gone from your phone, and it makes life way, way easier. So so that's my first bit of iOS 11 advice. And then let's move on to JP, because JP is a little triggered. JP says, a tip and a fish shake to Apple and iOS 11. I can't believe that Apple has deactivated the controls for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi radios in Control Center. When you turn them off in Control Center now in iOS 11, both of those things don't turn off. And he's right. And we mentioned this in a previous show, but it's worth uh, repeating. When you go into Control Center and turn off Bluetooth and or Wi-Fi, it just disconnects you from those devices. It does not turn off those radios. And the reason for this is because those radios are important to connect to, say, AirDrop, to connect to your Apple Pencil, um, and and to do a few other things. So Apple's leaving the radios on, but just disconnecting you from any devices other than your Apple Pencil and, and a few others uh, that might be needed to really kind of maintain the user experience with those things. And I, I, my guess is they did this because they got sick and tired of support calls from people saying, hey, my Apple Pencil doesn't work. And it's like, well, did you turn off Bluetooth? Yeah, because I didn't want to connect to my whatever. Okay. you know. Um, his concern, he says the radio stays on, thereby, in my opinion, causing battery drain and funky behavior if you are in an area with tons of Wi-Fi networks. He says the phone does try to find and still join. That hasn't been my experience with it, but I, I believe you, JP, and it's possible mine is the anomaly with uh, with that. So, uh, but here's the thing. I don't think that our opinion of whether or not these things use significant battery power is relevant. Really, what's what's important, what's relevant is whether or not they actually use significant battery, battery power. And I have not found that to be the case. Um, with Wi-Fi on and not connected or Bluetooth on and not connected to some device that's causing it to be active, the power draw is so, so very minimal from what I found that it, it, it just doesn't make a difference. Um, have you, have you found anything to the opposite, to the contrary of that, John? I find my battery gets sucked dry when I'm doing data. Well, that's all I'm going to say. I find that the largest consumer of battery on my phone personally is that if I'm going around on Wi-Fi or some of the other radios. Um, okay, but that, I'm going to ask the question again. Okay. Without the radios being connected to anything, do you find that they draw power just being on as opposed to off? And I have I, my experience is that that is not the case. What is yours? I wouldn't know if they were. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know the level that they're drawing when they're in an idle mode, I guess. Is that? Your, your yeah. That's well, that's what I'm saying is, is, you know, have you, I don't know. I'll to save battery. Have, well, I'm not, I'm not so much because I think this is more a software thing than a hardware thing. Uh, I mean, it's both, but, but I think the software matters here. What I found when, when the radios aren't connected, they just aren't drawing power, whether or not, they're on, they, they, they tend to go into a very low power state, even though the radio is technically still on. So, yeah, I mean, know. Bluetooth, low energy. I mean, that's, that's the deal. Uh -huh. And even Wi-Fi, you know, we're not talking tons of power. No, 
No, if it's not transmitting data or receiving data, it's not going to be using power. So, yeah. yeah uh, Whereas I don't, LTE, on the other hand, did I mention this before? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. But again, even with that, it, you know, it yeah. only consumes power now, if you're, if you're actually. Now, if you go, data. if you go to settings Wi Fi and you turn that off, then I assume that is the full off everything. <laughs> Correct. If you go to settings, Wi-Fi and settings, Bluetooth, you can turn them off there. Now, here's where it gets a little interesting. So there's no shortcut, like there's no 3D touch kind of funkiness. Well, there I is, but it's different. Um, if you go mm. to the control center and 3D touch on the network icons there, you will get two additional icons. You'll get the airdrop control and the personal hotspot control. But in my opinion, you get one other very valuable thing. You get to see the name of the Wi-Fi network to which you're connected, which is really handy, in my opinion. Uh, hey, yeah, look, I'm connected to Optimum. That's not right. Right. I'm connected to. Yeah. Oh, there's one like right across the street from me. No, you're supposed to be connected to mine. See? Why is it connecting? Oh, man. Yep. Well, clearly my network is working. So why is it being stupid? Clearly your network is working if we're able to have this conversation. <laughs> I know. So anyway, there, uh, there you go. So, uh, a next question from a listener, Bob, I, th I believe it's the same Bob we had before. It's Bob Levitas. He says, maybe, you know, an easy way to do this. If I go on iOS 11 to settings about applications, I see that there are dozens of incompatible apps on my iPhone. I can't do anything with them from settings and I can't even find a way to determine which of my 15 home screens, the darn files are on. So I'm looking for an easy way to delete them all at once. Uh, so there's two ways I have for you, Bob. One is what I already said. I'm amazing. You get an alphabetical list of your apps. You can delete them right from there uh, because they won't launch in iOS 11. But if you leave them on your phone and the, and the developer updates the app, then they will launch. So if it's something that you plan to rely on in the future and you have reason to believe the developer might update it, it's worth leaving the app on, even though it won't launch however uh if you want to delete it and you can't find it uh on your on your home screen i can i can offer you another way in which you also won't be able to find the app and that is going to settings general iphone storage and you can find apps and delete them from there the problem is they are organized by storage space used also not alphabetical so it's not the easiest way to delete them but maybe you'll have a better time finding it there. I don't know. There you go. That's the answer I have for you, Bob. Amazing is really the answer. Uh, you know, those guys have got to be cleaning up over there and, uh, and good for them. They deserve it because they make a good product. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I took a screenshot and manually deleted them. Right, because you could find them. That's Bob's problem is you just can't find well, that, a sea of apps. Yeah. It, it was a challenge sometimes. It's mm -hmm. like, where would I have put this? Right. Did I put it in utilities or did I put it in navigation or did I put it in transport? Uh, yeah, it's weird. It's weird to me that that um, that you that they there's no option to delete right from there in the in the, you know, right there. But whatever. Yeah, it would be the place to. That would be the place. Place to be. Hey, speaking of settings, we were talking post show last week in the chat room here at MacGeekab.com slash stream. And uh, and I'm also going to make that work for MacGeekab.com slash chat if I haven't already, by the way, because that would make wow. more sense. Right. Yeah. But anyway, well, we were, it's both. I think it is both. I think it works, but, but we'll make sure it works. Um, Graham was telling us we were talking about HEIF settings, the high efficiency image format. And uh, you can set your iPhone to do a few interesting things. So if you go to settings, photos, and I'm going to get there to make sure we're all doing this together. So settings, photos, transfer to Mac or PC, all the way at the bottom, you get to pick automatic or keep originals. Automatic uh, transfers photos and videos in a compatible format. It knows whether or not you're transferring to, say, a High Sierra machine that can take these new HEIF photos, which is a compression algorithm that, that is uh, generally pretty consistently better than JPEG, either higher quality at the same size or same quality at a lower size. Or uh, you can 
choose to always keep originals, which means it will always transfer HEIF, even if you're transferring to, say, uh, a Windows machine that might or might not take it or a Sierra machine that that won't be able to really do anything with those with those pictures. So that's one place to go. So that's settings, photos, then all the way at the bottom is this section labeled transfer to Mac or PC. Then uh, there's also settings camera. And if you go into settings camera, uh, I will find it. There it is on my phone. Settings camera formats. And uh, and in here in formats, you get to pick what the camera is going to capture. So you can choose to, to have it capture high efficiency or most compatible. And most compatible is a JPEG. This is choosing both the still picture and the video. So high efficiency is the HEIF or HEVC for video. And then most compatible is JPEG for pictures and H.264 for video. So there you go. That's where you want to go on those two things. Crazy. Crazy. Uh, it's it, And some people were saying when they upgraded their Mac to High Sierra and plugged their iPhone in, into their Mac for the first time, they got a little message up that said, hey, we're changing your, your format now that you're connecting to a device that can handle these HEIF pictures. So there you go. Crazy, right, John? Didn't happen to me. Maybe you had, you had already changed it because we did it uh, here together before, uh, I think. I think we did it here together before you upgraded to... Uh, to high Sierra. All right. I think, I think, I think you want to take us to Johnny, John. <laughs> yeah. So Johnny says, guys, I need help with photos on my iPhone. I don't use photos a lot, but recently went on a trip and took quite a few photos on his iPhone. I believe. Yeah. I organized the photos into albums on my phone. When I sync my phone, the photos version 1.5 uh, digital camera raw 6.21 and digital camera raw support. Um, and the albums on my phone, which is a success running 11.0, do not come along with the sync. All of the photos are there, but no albums. Is there a way to get the albums to sync? I do not use and do not want to use any of the iCloud services for photos. Um, I don't think you can do it. Well, in that. Now, let, let me be very specific here in what we're talking about when we talk about albums here. So, you fire up your phone. Now, here, the path that I usually take to go to it is I go to the camera, then I click on the thing in the lower left-hand corner, then I click on all photos, and then at the bottom, there's a little thing on the bottom right that says albums. So, you click on that, and what I see is camera roll, favorites, people, places, videos, selfies, bursts, live photos, and, and a few others created by some, uh, some apps. And you can create sure. more. Sure. So those are the albums that we're talking about here. Now, as far as I can tell, Dave, so I'm like, huh. Now, the thing is, that's not my usual workflow. So this is why I didn't, I, I haven't really gone down this path. And that usually, Dave, I'll import the photos into whatever photo management software I'm using, photos or otherwise, photos for the time being, and just drag them all in. Then I create an album on the software. It, the concept on the, of on the Mac it, side. Correct. The concept yeah. of creating an album and using it to organize on the iPhone has just never been a part of my workflow and neither has it been when, you know, I have a point and shoot though. I suppose you can do that as well. You can create a, Oh yeah. Especially if you got like an iPad or whatever, that's a great way to, to. Yeah. So I guess a lot photos. of cameras that have digital storage kind of allow you to create a file yeah. structure as well or yeah. albums uh, or ways to tag the photos. So it's all ways to organize things. Now, as far as I could tell Dave, so I plugged the phone in and the, uh, you know, I run photos and it says, oh, look, John's iPhone 7 is there. And so I click on it and it's like, yeah, here's here's all the photos that's that's on the device. And I'm like, well, yeah, but where's the button that shows the albums? <laughs> and uh, Dave, I don't I don't think it's there. In fact, it, unless I'm missing something and there's like a hidden option, I couldn't ha I couldn't find a way to have the Apple photo software display the album. I'll call it data structure that's stored on the phone. There was a piece of software I found that could do this for us, Dave. Yeah, what's it called? Well, it's called iMazing. Yep. And it did exactly what I wanted. Is yep. that So I plugged iMazing. I ran iMazing. It said, hey, here's John's iPhone 7. And then there's a photos icon. And I click on that. And guess what happens? Exactly what happens on the phone is that I see all the albums. And I even downloaded one of them. 
This is like the I Amazing episode. And I swear they they are not a sponsor of this episode. In fact, they're not an so, active sponsor of this show. So, but, you the, know, the mystery to me is we still love them. Why can't Apple software parse I mean, it's the same Yeah. They, they, they make the software, to. they make the hardware. Oh, I know why. And I, this goes back ages. I found a discussion thread that go, went back to like t- 2012. It's, it's just a feature Apple never felt necessary to expose um, on the iPhone, or at least there's no Apple software that makes it. Um, I mean, they allow it because iMazing can see it, well, but it's like, well, why can't Apple software see it? And maybe prior Apple software could, like, I don't know if Aperture could or, or no, no, iPhone no, or you just don't have enough Apple software. That the problem is, <laughs> no, 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 I'm serious. Like the, the issue is that Johnny doesn't want to use iCloud photo library. And that is Apple's prescribed workflow for doing so that would bring the albums over from the phone. Oh, totally. It, you get everything. It's your photo library ah. everywhere. Right. So it's people just people like us that refuse. No, to, don't uh, say to like us. The, don't, uh, you've got a mouse in your pocket, maybe, but I am happily on iCloud photo library and it's awesome. Well, no, I was saying Johnny and I, Johnny, are, you and Johnny. Oh, right. We, yes, we of are. Course. Yes. Johnny yeah. and Johnny. Yeah. We don't want to become part of the collective. So, right. It is, it is a blissful collective <laughs> though. Um, you can hear the thoughts of the others. Yes. Yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah. And no, it's great to have that stuff just everywhere. It's just magic. It's, it's what, it's how you would want it to work. I, but admittedly, you've got to cough up, you know, whatever it is. I mean, we pay iOS 11 actually made our iCloud photo library lives way easier and way cheaper with our family because we can use family shared storage. So I buy two terabytes of storage. I think as a family, we're using less than one terabyte for six of us, which includes my dad and his wife. And it's great. Everybody's on it. Everybody's backing up. There's no issue. And it's 10 bucks a month. So there you go. But that's, you know, you got to buy into the system. And I, and I realize that there's many reasons, financial being really only one of them that you may or may not want to buy into that system. So, you know, I, but, but that is a Apple's answer for it. I guarantee it. They might. All right. Yeah. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. It's time to bring the band in, John. Don't you think? I try not to. Yeah, okay. That's Let it's the safer machines that way. do that. Yeah. No, the machines think for us. That's that's important. I think that's good. Just get in front of the entertainment center. Yep. Push the, some Rick and Morty and just, just push the button and go. That's right. Isn't that that's, a crazy show? I like Rick and Morty. Yeah, thanks for introducing me to that. I hadn't <sighs> I hadn't seen that before. That was good. All right. Let's see. We have uh, well, we need to tell you how to contact us. All those folks that we listed as premium subscribers can email premium at MacGeekGab.com. But if you're not a premium subscriber, you can email us at feedback at MacGeekGab.com. And what he said, so there's no mistake, is feedback at MacGeekGab.com. It's true. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com, and I know that we are behind on on cleaning through that particular queue. That is kind of how it works. We get a little, if we get behind, that's the, that's the one that suffers. We, I, my feeling is we'll probably catch up this week. So, uh, so, you know, we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to call us, you can do that. 224-888-GEEK, John, which is? 4335. You can leave us a voicemail there. You can text us, whatever you want. We will get it. It's all good. And you can find us on Facebook. If you go to uh, macgeekgab.com slash Facebook, that'll bring you right to our group there. It's great. So many great people answering your questions. Uh, I'm behind on catching up with that too, but uh, but there's others out there helping you out. So it's good stuff. Really good stuff. I want to thank our sponsors. Of course, we had, uh, we had Plex on the show today for the first time. Plex.tv slash redeem where coupon code MGG gets you uh, a free month of their new Plex Pass, so please go check that out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast to check out all the great stuff uh, about the PDF Pen family. Uh, you can learn more about Barebones Software at barebones.com, Otherworld Computing at macsales.com, and uh, I think that's what we got for this one. It really does help when you go visit our sponsors. They We don't get paid by the click, but... 
when they see you sniffing around, they like to know that. No, they do. They they like to know that this works. It's good. Hey, uh, hey, John, I have I have a piece of advice for you. Going into New York again and and all oh, of that. No. Well, you have to, and and this time you got to do it alone because I'm not going to be with you, and I have to do it alone because you're not going to be with me. So you know the advice that I would sort of give to. In fact, I'll give it to everybody. It's not just you, not just me, for everybody. Don't get caught. See you next week. Maynard.